My name is Katie Sarma. I am a journalist at Inside Climate News, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Uh, we have an excellent lineup of speakers, but before um, we get to them, we have a special blessing from Randy Laysbad of the Ogala Gala Sioux Nation in Turtle Island, and Curry Kindi from the Quechua people in Ecuador. You please join us. Hello, how mitakuyapi. First of all, I like to speak in my native tongue. I'm a Lakota, Oglala Sioux Nation from Turtle Island in the United States. And uh, I'd like to greet each and every one of you with a warm handshake, those that are online and in the presence in the building here. Yeah, Randy Lays, but imachiapi. Yeah, etanwa u, wazi ahaha yapicha. Na Malakota, Lakota oyate tama una eapi mitraki Lakotiawa. Ochaya lampetuke, Ochekewa, Iwachi mamcha, Ochekewa ji watahin tele o minichele yashnani. It is an honor to come up in front of you humbly and ask to open up with a prayer or some few words. So I like to make a prayer to each and every one of you in attendance at the panels and everybody. So uh, I'm going to use my native tongue to make that prayer. Kungashila, Atewa Kantranka, Tatuya Topa, Unchimaka, Unshia Wahina Jina, Hoyeche, Hoyeche Lem, Niwacha Kota, Makochewa El Kananji Wahia, Kananji Wahia Le Hoyeche Hetan Kungashila. Omniche ya ian kelina tungashila, hokuta kea ahintuina, uchakchi washte yo tungashila. Oeche omniche ian kelina, oyate ya unshikapi, iotie kea umpi. Olina kaki jablina un ishtamni hu kea hoye nyampi. La tagota kigaleha pinchita chukashila. Ocha nawi chakchi unwo, na owi chakke yo, tokate kea. Chankuwa aka money pile iwashte pikte na taku washte shte wanka pikte tunkashila. Na ko wi chana hiki wi chonki xiapi hunku kitho ka biya pili na tunkashila. O he un leam petu ki wo pila chiche tunkashila. Unkichi washte ona tokate kuyamle unkichi washte po. Hao heche tuelo mitake o yasi. Thank you. Hatung apu hatung mama nyuka yuai to nyuka shungo taka mama kichurani pacha mama India ya ya kumama waira ya ya ursa taku nyuka nchita suma yuai ta suma shungo wakanya bita katingawa. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Kurkin. I'm from the Amazon rainforest of Ecuador, and I would like to do my service from my heart. Alita yu yari shateringichi. Ama sonas manda cielo, cielo usema, yuka masisa, duna amani. Kari yuyai, warmi yuyai tami, api shami shayarini. Kari shungu, warmi shungu tami, ali yuyai taku shami urini. Amazonas manda cielo. Cielo se ma yo casi sa una mani Indi lupchis kamari kushani Indi ay kush kamari kushami Nyukata mi yuyarisha 
ゆやりしゃしゃやりぎ。もんどにゃんびたぽりしゃ。もんどさちゃたりこしゃ。しゅうにゃんびりゃいみしゃやりぎ。しゅうにゃんびやいみしゃやり。あまそなすまんだしやる。しやるせまゆかしさ。ろなまに。いんりやいこしかまりこしゃみ。いんりやいこしかまりこしゃみ。よかったみよやりしゃ。よやりしゃ。しゃやりんぎ。あまそなすまんだしやろ。しやろせまゆかしさ。どなまね。かりよやいわみよやいたみ。あぴしゃみ。しゃやりに、かりしゅんぐ、わみしゅんぐたみ。ありゆやいたくしゃみ、ふりに。So nowadays, we are thinking a lot in our mind, or sometimes our mind is too busy. The son said, do not be distracted, do not be confused. Walking only one path. Ashkapa Gracho. Thank you. Thank you, Randy and Curry Kendi, for that.、Um, so,、uh, to kick us off, Today,、um, we're going to have Magnus Manhammer, of the, he, who is a member of Sweden's parliament, say a few words.、Uh, Magnus is from the same party as Olaf Palme, and Magnus has been a strong advocate for a, an ecocide crime in parliament. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you so much, all of you participating and listening to this seminar. So, As a father,、uh, the understanding of a common future and an environment that will be healthy and living is、uh, so much stronger. And it's deepening for every day that I'm alive. I'm thinking of my soon seven week baby back home and also my three and a half year young daughter. For, it's for them in many ways that I do this, but it's also, of course, for all of us. It's、uh, the most important thing we can do to bring a future that is clearer and more hopeful than before. So,、um, the crime of ecocide and a law against ecocide is a key issue, a key point to be able to, to tackle environment issues and be able to tackle this future that I spoke about. And、uh, I think it's all of our responsibility here, everyone, not just here, but also all over the earth, to bring this law of ecocide to be here, here in Sweden, in Europe, and in the global community. It must be enforced and it must be a reality. So that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm also really honored to be here. So thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much for, for bringing me here. And as a lawmaker,、uh, the, the crime of ecocide would be important not just on the global level, it would also mean a lot for our national legislation about、uh, environment issues. It would also mean a lot about,、uh, for our regional、uh, regulations and also on the local level. So the crime of ecocide would also change not just the global level, but also to the Small community and the small farm or community where you live, or the forest or the beach where you live close. So, we need this. It's, it's the key issue to, to actually tackle all the, the things that we see in the future. So, for me,、uh, it's also important to, to remember why we're here, just here in Stockholm, this 2022. This is 
50 years after the first UN environmental global conference. It was here in Stockholm and uh, the Prime Minister of Parliament was one of the uh, persons that took the initiative to this. And I would like to end my, my beginning on this extremely important seminar uh, with uh, a quote from his speech on that conference. I have it on my phone and I will read it so I don't read any words wrong. So this is Olaf Palma's speech, and in this speech he also mentioned, of course, the crime ecocide. And that's already 50 years ago, so really something has to happen now. Okay. When it comes to the environment, there is no individual future, neither for people nor nations. The future is common. In fellowship we must share it. Together we must create it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Magnus. That's a, a great way to get us started. Um, so we'll move to our panelists now. And the way this will work is that they will each have about seven minutes to say uh, why, in their view, it is important to make ecocide and in international crime. Uh, kicking us off is Owen Gaffney. Owen is a global sustainability analyst, a journalist, filmmaker, and writer. He is the head of media at the Stockholm Resilience Center, an international research center of resilience and sustainability science. His work focuses on synthesizing and assimilating knowledge on the state of the planet. He's written about climate and social tipping points, earth systems, and sustainable development. Owen? Thanks, Katie. Um, okay. Right. Great. Um, yeah. Thanks, Katie. And uh, it's it's wonderful to be here. Um, as uh, you know, as Magnus said, you know, uh, talking about um, children, um, you know, our children and our responsibility for our children. You know, we all have um, responsibilities to um, to look after our children, uh, but. Um, we also have legal requirements for people who don't look after their children. Um, there is uh, there is consequences to pay for that. Um, the same with you know driving a car. Uh, we have a responsibility to drive safely and carefully. Uh, but there's also legal consequences if we don't drive carefully and safely. And now uh, we are at a state of knowledge of the whole Earth system. Earth's life support system is such that we know. We are taking colossal risks with the state of the planet. We're, st we're, we're, we're taking colossal risks. Uh, we have a new responsibility for the future state of that planet. We're in the Anthropocene. Humanity is the key driver of change now within the, within the Earth system, within the biosphere. And, and this biosphere is, is very, very fragile. Um, if you think about it, that the place on Earth where life thrives, you know, you can go to the top of Everest, you know, that's pretty much the limit upwards and the bottom of the Mariana Trench. And that's 20 kilometers, uh, 20 kilometers um, of so this, uh, this very thin veil over the surface of Earth. And we know since the first conference on the environment in the last 50 years, uh, a staggering amount of information, knowledge, scientific data has come in on how we're affecting this this 20 kilometer area of the planet uh, and it's it's undergoing huge change right now um, back in 2009 uh, at the stockholm resilience center we uh, we looked at how do we keep this planet stable um, what are the stable systems that um, that have ensured that for the for the entire civilization for 10,000 years this planet has been in a remarkable remarkably stable state what, have, what has kept it in the, that stable state? And we identified nine boundaries that keep us within that stable state. We also identified back in 2009 that we'd crossed three of those boundaries um, and we risk then losing that stability. And they related to climate change, to biodiversity and biogeochemical cycles, our use of phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, since 2009, we've also assessed that a, a fourth boundary has been crossed related to land use and deforestation. Uh, and then just this year in 2022, 
we've assessed that two more boundaries, two um, have been crossed related to novel entities, particularly you know, plastic pollution, for example, um, and to, to, to fresh water, particularly soil moisture. So we've crossed six of nine boundaries. This is a precautionary principle for the planet. You know, across these boundaries, we move into this danger area where we risk crossing tipping points. And in fact, you know, 10 years ago, when we looked at tipping points related to climate, like the Atlantic overturning circulation, like the Greenland ice sheets, like the Amazon rainforest, like the boreal forests, like the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet, we assessed that there would be tipping point risk further in the future, maybe towards the end of this century. But when myself and colleagues went back to assess the state of those systems uh, back in 2019, just two years ago, we found that nine systems are undergoing profound change right now, unprecedented changes right now. So we're risking crossing tipping points right at this moment. This is a huge responsibility. We're the first generation to realize the scale of this responsibility and potentially the last generation to do anything really meaningful um, on, on that stability. So this, this is a responsibility and with responsibility, you know, there should come consequences if we're not acting to protect those, those, those places at tipping point risk, uh, the, 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 the global commons. Um, so this is why I think, you know, ecocide should be um, a, an international law. Um, there should be consequences for those knowingly pushing our planet beyond boundaries. Thanks, Katie. Uh, thank you, Owen. Uh, quite eye-opening. Um, all right, uh, we're going to move to our next speaker who unfortunately could not be here in person with us. But uh, Nemo Bassi is an environmental activist, author, poet, and architect. Uh, if you haven't checked out his, his writings before, I recommend you do. Um, he is the director of the Health of Mother Earth Foundation, an ecological think tank that advocates for food sovereignty and environmental and climate justice in Nigeria and Africa at large. Nemo is also a member of the steering committee of Oil Watch International. And in 2010, he won the Right Livelihood Award which is also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize for his environmental justice work. We're going to go to a taped message that Nemo sent us. Thank you so much for giving me this space to be a part of this conversation, even though I'm not physically in the same room with you. What is the beauty of technology? The issues we are discussing today is so vital to, to all of us and to all other species on planet Earth because our relationship with nature has been so much disrupted, just like our, our relationship with one another has been over time. Uh, this has come about because we tend to think, humans tend to think, that we have the supreme right to transform nature, to exploit nature, and to exploit the weak and the oppressed as much as we can, provided we are comfortable with extracting value by amassing profits and living what we believe is a good life. This continuous subtraction from the value that nature has given to other species and amassing power and the right to exhibit impunity is one of the reasons why we're having so many, so much brokenness in the world today. There's so much disconnect between humans and other species. And this disconnection has led to grave misbehavior in terms of how we relate to nature and to the other children of Mother Earth. This is exactly what has driven the climate breakdown. This is what has promoted exploitative economic models and this is why sometimes we choose to live the lie, to believe a lie, than to look at the truth of the situation of how we relate with, to us one another and how we relate with nature. Uh, this is one of the things that promoted slavery. It's something that promoted colonialism. And what is still promoting unjust international divisions of labor? Uh, coming to issues of extraction, we do understand that extraction basically is subtraction. It is not addition. 
We talk about value addition, but that comes only after we've taken massive value subtraction. And when you subtract from nature and not add anything and not have a sense of stewardship, a sense of responsibility, you only look at how you can transform what you've extracted so as to make things you believe enhance your well-being. This kind of makes humans go numb with regard to what is just. And it's time to begin to deconstruct. It's a time to begin to understand that we cannot keep moving in the wrong direction and expect to arrive at the correct destination. One of the key signposts that we need that would guide us to move in the right direction is making ecocide an international crime. The absence of a mechanism for holding humans and organizations responsible for massive destruction of Mother Earth has allowed things that are more or less unimaginable. In my experience, when I go to the oil fields of the Niger Delta or the mine fields of South Africa or Ghana or elsewhere in Africa, what I see is simply unimaginable. And yet, John is seen to be inevitable because political forces keep on arguing that unless you extract and burn fossils, humans cannot make progress. Now, what is progress if we're killing ourselves? What is progress if the soil that I have to grow crops is polluted to a depth of five meters, a depth of 10 meters? What is progress if the water that I have to drink is laced with benzene 900 times above World Health Organization standard? What is progress if I cannot enjoy the beauty of nature. If all I see are scars of massive extraction of, of toxic dumps that we all know that one or two lifetimes would not be enough to restore the environment to what it ought to be, to be safe for us to live in, to thrive and to flourish. Having a law that would provide the necessary checks is what is needed today. Otherwise, all the predictions about catastrophic global warming we are already experiencing at the level of temperature increase in the world today above pre-industrial levels, having extinction of species, we are already experiencing extinction of so many species. If they continue at this rate, we're going to get to a point where the planet Earth would be uninhabitable for humans. Mother Earth would go on without humans. It would just be a decision of humans to make her habitable, to enjoy her hospitality, or to make it impossible for us to enjoy the bounties of nature. And so this is a time for us, all legal experts, scientists, community activists, brothers and sisters across the world, to recognize that having ecocide as an international crime has global implications. Because the destruction of the environment in one location does not restrict the impact of that action to that location. And one example I like to give is, if we look at the way birds migrate, from Europe to Africa to other continents, from time to following the cycles of seasons, we could understand also very easily that they could also transmit diseases and other things that would otherwise have stayed in one place. And so if I contaminate the breeding grounds or the feeding spaces of this species in one location and believe that, well, it's only that location that is contaminated, the species that get there, be their birds or fishes or other animals, they could take this anywhere in the world. We do know, we've seen by exa the example of COVID-19 that spread across the world in no time. It had an origin. We may not know the origin right now, but it started from somewhere. It could be by the way we interact with the environment, by destructive actions of humans. It could also be through tampering of the genetic makeup of certain species in the laboratories. But whatever it is, 
you could trace it back to human action. And so curtailing the impunity of humans in our relationship with other species and relationship with Mother Earth is so vital. And recognizing it because as an international crime is one giant step that will secure us a place on this blue planet. Well, we could have spent time drink coffee to discuss this issue further, but I believe there will be opportunities when we meet physically so we can take this conversation forward. Thank you so much for giving me the space to share my thoughts. All right. Uh, thank you, Nemo. Um, our next speaker is Mindahi Bastida. He is an elder spokesperson, elder and spokesperson with the Otomi Toltec Nation. He's the director of the Original Nations Program at the Foundation, an organization that works to align the global economic system with care for the earth and for the benefit of future generations. Mindahi is also a UNESCO consultant for sacred sites and biocultural issues. He has been a caretaker of the philosophy and traditions of the Otomi Toltec peoples and a ritual ceremony officer. Mindahi. Good morning, everybody, brothers and sisters. And it's a big honor to be here. And I was, I just want to give honor to the Sami, Sami peoples from these lands. And uh, thank you for your presence, uh, Grandmother Helen. And also, we are here with uh, some members of the Mother Earth delegation and also representing the Alliance Guardians of Mother Nature. For us, it's a great privilege to be here in this table and also acknowledging people who have been working for so many years. And Sweden has been key for these dialogues. My first touch with the UN system was in 1992 at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. It meant like 20 years later. But, uh, you know, when I was informed that there was going to be uh, an event in Stockholm, I said to the Mother Earth delegation, we should be there. We should come together. But let me tell you that we don't have that much to celebrate. But yes, to commemorate special calling for the care of life. So we are here, and we are all also very honored to be here in these territories. And that's the reason we want to honor the Sami, because they are very close to our cosmologies and to our way of thinking, where we can come together, and is that's the reason I'm mentioning 1992, because it was the first time that the traditional knowledge of original so-called indigenous peoples was important for the survival of human species. And then, you know, it has been so many, many years and we have seen from the this kind of growth based on greed and anthropocentric way of thinking is killing Mother Earth, is killing people. So we first heard before the ethnocide as a crime. Now we are hearing about ecocide. It's just a concept but a very important concept to raise awareness about the misbehavior of many people and some nations that have been taken over instead of taking care. The deep relationship that we have as original nations and peoples is based in reciprocity. And also in those concepts, as, as was mentioned, this uh, science and precaution, precautionary principle. We don't take more than we need. 
But now we see that 5% of the original nations and peoples of the world are taking care and giving care of the 80% of biodiversity that is left in the world. But let me tell you something. We don't just take care for that, for that 80%. We think about Mother Earth as an intelligent being. And we, when we pray, we, we pray for the whole planet, for the whole Mother Earth, because it's a unity in the diversity. So now we see that uh, the international regimes, especially the environmental regime that was born in 1992, with the Convention on Bi Biological Diversity, the Convention of the Certification and the Convention of Climate Change, let me tell you that we are failing. We are not better than those days. It's very sad. What we bring here is ancestral wisdom. How we can reconnect to nature how we can reconnect to this beautiful planet that is Mother Earth. Accordingly to our teachings, it was around 7,000 years ago that there were like 13,500 different cultures in the world. And now we have, we almost have half. And it's very concerning because we are losing languages, we are losing biodiversity, we are losing, there is a, a, a biocultural erosion because we don't divide nature and culture, it's coming together. That's the reason we really respect the concept of bio, biocultural diversity, biocultural heritage. And there is no one nation state in the world that protect biocultural heritage as such, together. Because in one side there are environmental laws that are very permissive, and they are now menacing that 80% left. So we have lost almost half of the languages, and it's very, very sad. Because when you lose a language, you lose that touch with the sacred, that ancestral wisdom that we need to recover as human beings. It's our problem, but it's also your problem. Nation states cannot do it on their own. Ourselves, we cannot do in our own now. We need support, and we need your support. We need to support international governmental organizations, non-NGOs, non-governmental organizations as well, and institutions. We need to come together. The problem is so complex. We are late. We are very late. But, you know, it has been said that Mother Earth can live without us. A certain point is true, and a certain point is not. Because this is an intelligent being. And who knows who behaves and who doesn't. So this is a cleansing process. Accordingly with the, our prophecies and the ancestral knowledge, we are living through this process of cleansing. And the prophecy says that the new dawn is coming. From 2013 to 2026, there are 13 years. May 3rd, 2013 ended the long account of the Mayan calendar. So we have this day, these years, to recover peace with Mother Earth, and to recover dignity as human beings. Curricula in the school, in the university, must change. Our education must, change, must be changed.
from the anthropocentric way of thinking to the more ecocentric. And for that, this new regime that is being born through the rise of nature or the earth jurisprudence must be a knowledge. And the ecocide must be a knowledge as a crime. Because at the local level, there in the communities we suffer. Not just ethnocide, but ecocide. It's coming to, it's together. This ecocide, ecocide crime must acknowledge also the cultural relationship that we have with nature. And the judges must understand that we are together. We are nature. Aren't we? What kind of creatures we are? Why we are here in this world? We know that we have a, a general mission to be here in this world. It's the care of life. Even the, the sustainable development paradigm is failing because it is in the same mindset. And now you see that there is greenwashing politics everywhere through the carbon offsets. And they say, oh, we win paradigm. It's just a justification to continue doing business as usual. So we must change. We offer the good living paradigm where the water is not a resource, it's a sacred element, it's an element of life. Where the air is not a resource, it's a sacred element as well. Where we need clean energies with clean ideas. And we need a science that is not unilateral, is not linear. We need, we need a, a transdisciplinary science where all kinds of methodologies come together and we need that science shouldn't be neutral. Science for the good living, for the care of life. We need to recover soils, but also our way of thinking in this sacred relationship. Because we have to honor our ancestors and we are becoming ancestors for the future generations. What are we delivering? In the anthropocentric way of thinking is the intergenerational equity. But it's not that way only. It's what kind of people we are delivering to this beautiful planet. We must be more humble. We must transcend as human species, the time is now. This is the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mandahi. Um, so one of our speakers, uh, Stephen Donzinger, was going to join us by Zoom, but I understand there's some technical problems. So uh, he did send a message, um, and he has spoken at other Stop Ecoside events here at Stockholm. Um, but the message that he sent was, uh, the battle for humanity is to get behind ecocide as an international crime. So thank you, Stephen. Uh, and we'll move down the line here. Um, we have Patricia Gulinga. Patricia is a leader of the Quechua people of Sarayaku in the Ecuadorian Amazon. She is an advocate for the rights of indigenous peoples and nature. And earlier this year, she was awarded the Olaf Palme Award for her work. Patricia's work has shown the world that humanity can have a more balanced and sustainable relationship with nature. Patricia, welcome. Good morning, and uh, thank you for this invitation. Do you hear me now? I feel more comfortable with this. 
Primeramente, quiero honrar a los pueblos originarios de estas tierras. First and foremost, I would like to honor uh, uh, the, uh, the people of uh, uh, all the people of this uh, earth. Los Samis. The Sami people. Hermanos nuestros, aunque no hablemos el mismo idioma. Uh, our brothers, uh, who we also uh, share uh, the same Atusan languages with. Y quiero honrar su lucha contra las mineras. I would like to honor their uh, struggle against the minery. Para nadie es desconocido la lucha que tenemos los pueblos indígenas por cuidar la naturaleza. It's no secret uh, the struggle that uh, us uh, native people have uh, against the industries. Hay tantas historias en el mundo sobre la lucha, la defensa, la muerte de los defensores, la destrucción de los ecosistemas. There are so many tales uh, and histories uh, about the struggles, uh, the death, and uh, uh, against uh, um, the destruction of uh, uh, nature. Yeah. Historias muy dolorosas que han hecho que de cierta forma estemos todo el tiempo en la primera línea de resistencia. Very hurtful stories that make us be in the uh, first line of resistance. Gracias a esa lucha todavía podemos hablar de ecosistemas, de bosques, de naturaleza intacta en algunas partes del mundo. Thanks to them, we can uh, speak about uh, ecosystems that are, uh, we have known about that are uh, untouched uh, in the world. Antes nuestra visión era considerada una visión que no tenía sentido. Y me alegro que en esta época nuestra visión de pueblos y nuestra forma de ver la naturaleza empiece a tener sentido en un mundo globalizado. First, our struggle was uh, seen as something that didn't make any sense, but thanks uh, to uh, our struggle, our message is now being heard, and we are considered uh, now to, uh, that uh, our struggle for uh, uh, natives and the nature is now making sense uh, in a globalized world. Nosotros, porque habemos tres ahorita, venimos de la Amazonía, un ecosistema tan biodiverso del mundo. We, as uh, people, we come from the uh, Amazon, uh, that uh, is a place with the great uh, biodiversity of nature. Un ecosistema que es una de las fuentes de agua dulce más importantes también para el planeta. Uh, an ecosystem that uh, provides uh, one of the uh, most important sources of uh, fresh water in, in the world. También dicen que somos el pulmón del mundo. They also call us the lung of the uh, world. Pero lo que sí sabemos es que es gracias al ecosistema amazónico también hay cierto equilibrio todavía en, este, en esta madre tierra. But uh, what we do know is that uh, thanks to the uh, Amazonic ecosystem, there's still some uh, balance uh, of the nature in the world. Ahora se habla de crisis climática. We are not talking about climate crisis. Y todavía no se encuentra soluciones. Still, there are no solutions to be found. El mundo que habla de la economía apuesta todos su, sus su pensamiento en extractivismo, petróleo, minería, tala de bosques, hidroeléctricas. The world that uh, talks uh, so much uh, about the uh, development, it's putting uh, its way of thinking in extraction of uh, petrol, of uh, logging, of uh, 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 extraction of minerals. Dicen que es por el bienestar de la humanidad. They say it's for the uh, good of the of humanity. Lo que no se han dado cuenta es que esta visión ha puesto en peligro absoluto la supervivencia del ser humano. What they haven't uh, uh, come across is that uh, they have put uh, the uh, survival of the of mankind in peril, in a huge peril. Nuestros ancestros ya nos lo advirtieron, nos dijeron, se han vuelto locos, van a convertir esta tierra en espuma, no lo podemos permitir. Uh, our ancestors warned us uh, about this. Uh, they warned us and said that they will convert uh, this world into foam if we don't uh, stop this. 
Y por eso pensamos que es el momento de que reaccionen a una nueva forma de relacionarse con la naturaleza. Therefore, we think it is uh, the time has come to uh, uh, come up with uh, a new way of uh, uh, relate ourselves to nature. Yo lo llamo volver a nacer. Nacer. Uh, we, we to, uh, I call it a return to being. ¿Por qué? Porque Why? es una nueva forma de entender, de comunicarse, de hablar, de sentir a la naturaleza. Because it's a new way of... Uh, talking about to uh, uh, understand and to be in touch with nature. Pueblos como el mío, yo soy de, del pueblo de Sarayaku, lo llaman selva viviente. People like me, I am from uh, the Sarayaku uh, uh, people, we call it uh, living uh, with uh, uh, nature. Porque se tiene que entender que la naturaleza, la tierra, es un ser vivo, consciente y por lo tanto es sujeto de derecho. Because we must understand that uh, nature is uh, a living being uh, with uh, rights. Y ese sujeto de derecho está reclamando sus derechos. Y ahí entra el tema del ecocidio. This subject uh, of, uh, with uh, rights is uh, uh, now enters uh, uh, that it's uh, having... Uh, getting in touch with ecocide and therefore it's uh, the the time has come the time has come to call for uh, uh, claiming those rights nuestro pensamiento racional nos ha hecho creer que solo lo que vemos es lo que existe our rational uh, way of thinking uh, has uh, told us that uh, only what you can uh, see is uh, uh, what you can uh, know ignorando lo que sentimos ignoring what we feel pero mucho más allá de nosotros, hay otros seres protectores de la naturaleza a cuya vida le debemos nuestro equilibrio. But far from uh, uh, those uh, uh, things, we uh, there are people who uh, actually protect uh, nature that we can uh, come in uh, contact with that can uh, preserve our life. La destrucción de un ecosistema destruye también la vida de ellos porque también son seres Mortales, no espíritus. Mortales, igual que nosotros, solo con otras funciones diferentes. The destruction of uh, ecosystems uh, means that we are uh, destroying uh, their uh, livelihood uh, as well. They are uh, people uh, and uh, uh, beings uh, with, uh, they are mortal beings, uh, beings uh, that have uh, their uh, life and uh, they have Be, have their lives destroyed. Ellos no pueden venir a hablar acá, no pueden dar entrevista con la prensa, no pueden estar ante tribunales de justicia, pero habemos voceros que hemos tomado la decisión de denunciar esta destrucción, que es la destrucción de la regeneración misma de la vida. And they uh, cannot uh, come here, they cannot uh, talk to the press, they cannot uh, claim uh, Uh, trials uh, for uh, justice, but uh, we can uh, be as uh, their, uh, we can uh, forward their voices and uh, make their uh, claims uh, for uh, their rights. Como seres humanos nos complicamos derechos humanos, derechos de la naturaleza que por cierto está aprobado en Ecuador, derechos para todo. Hay un derecho universal que es el derecho a la vida y ahí involucra todo. Uh, we are not uh, only talking about uh, uh, rights for uh, humans, for uh, individuals, uh, for nature like we have in Ecuador. We are uh, talking about the universal right uh, that uh, is claimed for uh, every uh, living uh, thing on this world. But it's necessary to understand it. If we don't understand it, we have to insist that for various rights, we are protecting that destruction. But we must understand each other, and we must uh, come together and understand each other, and uh, because otherwise we cannot uh, make uh, uh, this claim and uh, call uh, for battle uh, to the destruction uh, of this earth and nature. Todas las discusiones globales, crisis climática, eh, conservación, van a ser un fracaso si no incorporan la visión propia, profunda, sagrada, que nace desde los pueblos indígenas. All these uh, summits of global talk uh, of uh, uh, 
uh, species will not uh, mean uh, anything if we don't uh, come uh, together in the universal uh, yeah. thinking uh, that uh, we uh, as natives uh, uh, have uh, in our uh, in our claim. Pero que no quede solo en papeles porque no somos expertos en dejar escrito en papeles, sino que se empiece a aplicar en el territorio, a ejecutar, que hay acciones. But this must not stay uh, on paper. We are experts in uh, having this only stay on paper. It, it must be done, uh, come into action, and, and must uh, mean something, that uh, they will, um, it must be uh, something uh, done. Son tiempos difíciles, pero son tiempos de acciones también. These are hard times, but there is also a time for action. Los pueblos indígenas seguimos luchando. As natives are still continuing the struggle. Pero ya no solo es nuestra responsabilidad, sino la responsabilidad de todos actuar. But it's not our, only our uh, responsibility to act, but it's uh, the responsibility for everyone uh, to act. Hay tantas cosas que hacer en, en ciudades, en comunidades, en territorio. Todos pueden hacer algo. There are so many things uh, to do in uh, cities, in communities, uh, in uh, within territories. Uh, so uh, the field is open. Por eso la decisión que se tome como persona, como colectivo, es importante. Les invito a la acción, a estar accionados, a estar actuando, a empezar a presionar fuertemente desde cada uno de los países. Therefore, uh, it's, uh, I invite you all to, uh, uh, to uh, come uh, into battle and uh, to uh, join uh, forces and uh, I, uh, to, uh, 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 to come into action for uh, this uh, issue and uh, this question. Solidarícese con los pueblos indígenas, aquí en Suecia, en Alemania, en la Amazonía, en cualquier lado que estén, desde los distintos lados. Yo creo que eso ayudaría muchísimo. Solidarize, solidarize uh, yourselves with the native uh, peoples, not only here in, in, uh, in Sweden, but in Germany, in every other uh, nation, uh, come uh, with us uh, in this uh, struggle. Y bueno, sí. Bienvenido, que el ecocidio sea una ley, lleven al tribunal de la Haya para que de alguna vez, en algún momento, se entienda que destruir la naturaleza, la tierra, es la destrucción de la vida misma del planeta. And let's hope that we will have a, one a type of a court like the one in The Hague, uh, where um, a destruction of a, a nature and, uh, is considered to be a, a crime. Uh, and because uh, the destruction of nature is uh, a destruction of uh, life and uh, livelihood. Muchísimas gracias por escucharme. Thank you for, very much for uh, listening to me. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, we're going to move uh, next to Jojo Meta. Uh, Jojo co-founded Stop Egocide in 2017 alongside barrister and legal pioneer, the late Polly Higgins. The goal of Stop Egocide is to support the establishment of egocide as the fifth crime before the International Criminal Court in The Hague. As executive director of Stop Egocide, Jojo has overseen a rapid growth of the movement. There are now Stop Egocide teams or associates in 28 countries, including here in Sweden, um, which I understand predated Stop Egocide. Um, and discussion of Egocide law is on public record at the parliament or government level in over 20 countries. Uh, last year, Jojo convened an independent expert panel uh, that drafted a consensus legal definition for Egocide. Jojo, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and we've heard so much from the different speakers so far about what is needed and about why it is needed. And that brings us really to the heart of um, the purpose of this event, which is to look at how we can bring that into being. Um, and that 
for us is all is is very much what ecocide law and making ecocide an international crime is all about. Um, there's, I mean, interestingly, in order to prepare for the talks this this week here in Stockholm, um, we realised how sort of poignant it is, uh, as well as pertinent for the the initiative to criminalize ecocide. Obviously, there's the resonance with Olaf Palmer mentioning ecocide 50 years ago and describing serious environmental destruction with that word, and that being its first entry into the diplomatic world, and realizing that 50 years later, it is only now that it's really you know, becoming a live conversation on the international stage. But in preparation, I actually read the declaration that came out of that first conference, You know, the actual text of it. And I almost had a sense of vertigo because it was like the the wonderful pronouncements about how we need to protect the environment and how we need to interact with the environment um, and and consider it in all of our policy making decisions. You know, this was this was said. You know, I was reading it in this old fashioned, what feels now old fashioned typescript um, from 1972, and kind of realizing, oh my gosh. All of this that is being said here is still relevant today, is doubly relevant today, because actually those aspects that involve protecting the environment from that document don't feel to have been taken seriously by the governments of the world. And so, you know, we now find ourselves in a position where we're actually now fully informed, as, as Owen was saying, fully informed as to the dangers and as to the, the you know, destructive results of our human economic activity, you know, what that's producing at a scientific level. We now have its beginning. It's nothing like as much as it should be. We have the beginnings of the inclusion of the threads of understanding from native peoples from around the world um, who understand that this is an issue not just of science but of mindset as well um, and so all of this feels like it's it's beginning to converge in a way that should have happened many decades ago um, and so it, it you know it's both a moment of uh, yeah a kind of incredulity I think but also a moment of of opportunity and of coming together um, and just to look at a, a bit about the background and the you know where we've come to with this initiative i think it's it's important to to do that to sort of realize where we are and why this is such a an important moment and why stockholm and this conference that's going to be taking place over the next two days can be a moment to accelerate the inevitability of bringing in this protective law so although discussion went on in the 70s in the legal and political worlds it kind of the whole concept of ecocide went a bit quiet for a couple of decades. A clause almost made it into the Rome Statute, which is the governing document of the International Criminal Court, almost in the 90s. And a number of quite powerful countries, interestingly, all oil states, the UK, the US, France, the Netherlands, all objected to its inclusion and it didn't make it. When the International Criminal Court opens its doors, in 2002, 20 years ago, so it's another anniversary there. The crimes that it had jurisdiction over were genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Recently, crimes of aggression was also added to that. It might be good just to take a moment to imagine what world we might be living in now if Ecocide had made that document 20 years ago. And when Polly Higgins um, really sort of dedicated the last 10 years of her life to championing the uh, moving forward of criminalizing ecocide. The way she saw she was doing that was as replacing, if you like, a crime that should have been there in the first place. And I think this also speaks to, again, to, to what we've heard about, um, you know, our mindset and how we treat nature. Um, there's a very deep sense of separation, of kind of competition, compartmentalization, alienation that is deeply inbuilt in our Western attitudes. Um, and it's it's not something that we can blame any one person living for. It's something that's been developed over many centuries, you know, a dualism that goes right back in the Western canon to Plato, ideal versus the real, through the Catholic Church, the spirit versus the body, right through to the scientific paradigm where rationality is pitted against nature and against emotion. So we have this very deeply ingrained separation and dualism. And there's a way in which addressing destruction of nature on the legal level 
in a way that is relatively simple, in other words, adding a crime to an already existing list in a system that already exists, and that's one of the benefits of, of approaching it at the ICC, is that that court directly accesses the criminal justice systems of its member states. If you make something a crime there, you have to ratify it in your own country as well. Doing that, putting ecocide alongside genocide, has the possibility of subtly but profoundly beginning to shift and to bridge those paradigms. Because if we consider ecocide to be as bad, as dangerous, as important to consider as genocide, in other words, that the living world around us matters as much as the people around us, and indeed is directly intertwined and linked with that, then we're really starting to shift our understanding of the importance of that relationship. And so that's a really profound and incredibly potent and, and concrete thing to do at this moment. And it also responds to what I've certainly perceived, and, and, and I imagine many of you will have as well, as a kind of rising frustration, a frustration at the grassroots level, at the activist level, um, a, a frustration at the level of NGOs who've been working for decades around different environmental issues, at the level of sustainability leaders in business who are wanting to do the right thing, and even perhaps some of those leaders in sectors that are notorious, but who, with the right rules in place, could go in a new direction. And frustration also at the government level, at the policy making level, because there are multilateral agreements now in place and more being discussed. You know, there's, a, there's just this week, there's a treaty around uh, reducing and, and gradually disappearing the use of plastic over time. Um, and that's taking place um, this week as well. You know, all of these treaties, it's like, there's some wonderful resolutions in them. There's some really important policies to implement. And yet the action that we're seeing in the world is so slow. You know, we're kind of crawling. We need to be sprinting. We don't have time, huh, literally. If, 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 the, um, if we take seriously the international reports that are coming out, which let's bear in mind are quite conservative in their, you know, in their pronouncements, like the IPCC reports, those reports are now telling us that you know, we have scant few years to turn this around. So there's this huge frustration that action is not happening fast enough. And we firmly believe that putting in place a crime of ecocide at the international level could have an incredibly galvanizing effect, an enabling effect for those agreements. Because the way that human beings are, the way that business is, is it is very difficult to change habit. We're deeply ingrained in these grooves of business as usual. Science has been telling us for decades we need to do something. Original Nations voices have been telling us for <laughs> centuries that <laughs> we need to be doing something. You know, um, and yet, you know, this has been very difficult to materialize. And as human beings, we often don't change our habits, you know, unless external circumstances force us to, or unless the rules change. And criminal law has a unique ability to make a difference in that. It has a huge potential for changing behavior. Just as a small example, there was a study done in Colorado, I believe, a few years ago, about what happens in, to corporate behavior when you change environmental law. And their conclusion was that if you change regulation, which is where most of environmental law sits around the world, if you change regulation, you change corporate budgeting. They might allocate more funds for court cases or for compensation or for those kinds of things, for fines. When you add a criminal law element, you start to change behavior. And that is what is missing currently in the environmental law arena. All of our law following that dualism that I mentioned earlier, you know, is very much focused around people and around property to the extent that we have a situation where a corporation is a legal person. And yet in most of the world, the natural world is not. <laughs> you know, it's be, you know, it's beginning. That that rights of nature movement is growing, but isn't it interesting that you know across the board a corporation is treated as a person? So you know, it's 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 time and it's practical to be thinking about criminal law as a framing condition for this shift, this bridge that we need to make to a new way of thinking and to a new way of behaving in relation to nature, because criminal law in our culture is what we use to draw the moral lines. 
It's the system we use to draw the red lines beyond which we shouldn't go. We all know you can't go to a government and say, could I have a license to kill 500 people for my new infrastructure project? It wouldn't cross our minds because it's such a profound taboo and criminal law enforces that. We need a taboo around the destruction of ecosystems and we need it to sit at the level that is foundational that is amongst the worst crimes so that actually we begin to shift that understanding but also so that we begin to galvanize movement in the right direction and this conversation is building we had two very key milestones last year one was the emergence of a definition a legal consensus definition of ecocide which is very compact um, it's it's just two paragraphs and the core paragraph is so short that it can fit on the back of a business card and it's ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. Now, since that definition was launched into the public sphere, there's been a massive momentum and acceleration behind this conversation at the international level. And from almost a standing start in 2019, when Vanuatu, the Pacific Island state, was the first to call for this at the International Criminal Court, there's been a huge um, momentum in the conversation, particularly since the definition emerged, so that now, as Katie mentioned earlier, this conversation is live in over 20 member states of the International Criminal Court, and there is already a very strong call here in Sweden, in Stockholm, for this conversation to be a major part of the conference this week, coming from the youth, coming from NGOs, um, and coming from states as well, and the consultations that have led up to this conference. So this is a huge um, conversation in progress and it was presented, the definition was presented to the Assembly of States parties at the International Criminal Court in December last year with the support of three of the world's most climate vulnerable states, Vanuatu, Samoa and Bangladesh, with a diplomatic intervention from Belgium, which is also a front runner in this conversation, where a big majority of their parliament have demanded um, the government legislate for ecocide nationally and internationally. So that just kind of brings us up to speed with how fast this is moving, how, um, how much more seriously it is now being taken, but also I hope I've been able to give a flavor of how it can address the issues that we've been hearing about in the, the earlier part of, of this panel. Um, and what we also know is that, and we know this from a survey in the UK, so it's not worldwide, but it's a good taster. What we know is that when people hear about criminalizing ecocide, over half instantly agree that it's a good idea to do it. So this is an invitation to everybody watching this uh, here in the room, but also around the world to talk about criminalizing ecocide and to call for it because it's, it's not just a concept, it's a practical instrument for, you know, on so many levels that is simply waiting to manifest. Thank you. Thank you, Jojo. Uh, I do want to add, so I understand, I mean, not just corporations have legal personhood or variation of it. Uh, ships, trusts, universities, at least in the United States, um, just something, something to think about. Uh, all right. Um, well, we're, we're going to move into a little Q&A with the panel. Um, and I'm going to get us started. Uh, and it, this question goes to uh, sort of the international uh, law aspect. Um, and anyone on the panel can grab it. Some people, their criticism of an ecocide crime is that they sort of recoil from the idea of placing the environment on par with humans. Um, for them, placing ecocide alongside genocide or crimes against humanity would detract from the special protection afforded to humans. And just want to give, give you a chance to respond to that. Yes, this is a question that comes up quite a bit, um, and in some places more strongly than others. Um, you know, should ecocide be placed alongside genocide? And I think that in that context, it's very important to separate um, two different aspects um, in the 
consideration of it. One is the level of intention. Now, clearly, with genocide, you know, the, the definition is to, you know, intentionally destroy a people in whole or in part. And I completely understand and agree that this is potentially the most evil um, intention that one could have. And in that way, ecocide is very different. Ecocide tends to happen as a as the collateral damage in a di you know a, another intention. The intention is usually to either you know to make money or if it were being very generous, it's obviously the intention to you know to farm or to whatever else it is. Um, but effectively, the intention is not. You set out to go. I'm going to destroy a rainforest. You set out to go. I'm going to, you know, farm cattle, whatever it is, um, and make lots of money. Um, so the intention is different. However, the important aspect is to look at the consequences, because uh, from a legal perspective, because the consequences, and of course, this is now becoming much more um, commonly understood, you know, through the work of people like like Owen and and the scientists around the world um, for the, the the sort of the Western dominated sort of media sphere is to, is to kind of, you know, to understand um, what the level of consequence is of destruction of nature. You know, we, we, uh, Owen very clearly described how we're already past, we've already passed several of these planetary boundaries. And so the continued destruction will actually end up threatening not just a people, not just a part of a people, but the whole of human civilization as we know it. And I think when we look at it in that perspective, it becomes very clear why ecocide actually does belong up there with the crimes that the Rome Statute is designed to address, so those that threaten the peace, security, and well-being of the world. Yeah. If I can add, uh, because yes. we've, we've done a test run in Iceland, we put forward a proposal uh, on ecocide this winter, and uh, we get these questions a bit, but we get much more the response that people understand it instinctively, because we all have the experience from our surroundings from our, our national legislation uh, where yeah. uh, corporations and governments have been working together to lessen the protection of nature. Everyone has an example of a beautiful place that's been damaged, uh, of an ecosystem that's been disrupted in the name of uh, alleged economic progress. Yeah. So I'm, I, I've met much more people that uh, understand the, the concept, that don't object to it, but than people that, that find it difficult to, to fit into their framework. Because, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the public is, is much more open to these things than, than politicians are. And, and I just want to say, because we, have, we haven't introduced Andres yet, but Andres uh, Janssen is a member of, the, a member of parliament in Iceland, and, and he's going to speak um, as, later as we wrap up. Um, but happy that you're jumping in and, and please continue to do so. Uh, another question I have, and, and anyone can grab it, um, uh, Patricia and I were actually talking about this a, a bit yesterday, and uh, when decisions are made to engage in projects that potentially cause mass harm, these decisions are made usually in places far away from the site of the harm. They're made by financial institutions that decide to fund the projects, you know, executives and companies. And uh, there is a gap in, in space and time between those decisions and the, the harm that potentially happens. And I'd love to hear both sort of I mean, what you make of that and how, you know, how Ecoside can, can close that gap. Um, uh, but just how that 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 space has possibly led us to where we are. Any thoughts around that? I mean, yeah, maybe I, I can start on that. I mean, I think it's a really, really um, good good point. Um, uh, at the Resilience Center, my colleagues have done some work um, on, called Sleeping Financial Giants, for example, um, and looking at how the finance sector is um, investing. In, uh, in 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 corporations that are you know destroying the Amazon rainforest or um, potentially you know destabilizing the boreal forest um, in these sort of tipping point areas places that um, at risk of tipping points how the financial community is investing in that and um, and um, and what we find is that it's, it's very very difficult to trace the flow of money 
uh, with, you know, because it's not just going through one corporation, it's going through then shell corporations and it's going into um, tax havens and then out of tax havens, etc. And this, you know, very, very long um, trail. You need to do almost like a sort of a huge investigation to follow that money. Um, to, and and that, that leads to no accountability um, or very little accountability. Um, and we need to change that. I mean, I think the, uh, the, the, when, when, when you start unfolding it, you know, some of the biggest investors in the world, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, you know, the biggest institutional investors um, are keystone actors. They are having a huge impact on, um, on the stability of the planet through those investments. Um, and so I think, um, you know, Ecoside, can uh, can then start to, to to point those fingers to be able to provide a mechanism for um, for accountability um, for the uh, investment community. Anyone else like to to add to that? Thank you, Owen. Yes, thank you. Um, for the beginning, we think that there is a big gap. Uh, you know, investors, they take into consideration just uh, data about ecosystems and where they are going to be uh, investing, but they don't take into consideration uh, local peoples. They don't take into consideration uh, species, the mineral world, because they think they are just things. You know, and I remember this, uh, the, the so-called paper walls, the doctrine of discovery, because uh, we were seen as beings that we didn't have soul. So, so nature <laughs> doesn't have soul, doesn't have spirit. But in our cosmovision, we have, we know that the mountains, the creeks, the rivers, they, they, are, they have a spirit. So this, this misconception of uh, human beings seen as the only ones who have intelligence. But now we, we see that science is acknowledging that we, uh, also those plants, those animals, they have energy, intelligence. We are not, not the only ones, uh, social beings. You know? So we... Uh, are far of understanding about what life is. But it's not just the material interrelationship, but it's the spiritual, the energy interrelationship that there is. So how the, the investments for the, the world can understand that? I think they should be educated as well. And also, you know, when some unions they, their savings are used to invest in somewhere in the world because they want uh, revenue because it's based in the growth. So this all this economic system is is killing life. So we must change that. And I think even with the eco side, crime as being a knowledge is not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough. We need. Uh, we are in a civilizational crisis, very deep civilizational crisis. We need, must change not just the matter, but mind and the spirit, how we interrelate to the sacred. So we might understand from the, you know, from the science point of view, many things, but understanding is not enough. We need wisdom. Information is good, and you can find it in your, in your you know, in your devices, a lot of information. Yeah. Science is good, but science is not neutral. It has an intention. And the intention has been always to take over more than other things. How to domain. So we are thinking about the dominion code, the domination code. All of this is to take over and not to share Instead of competing, we must collaborate. So we need that kind of science. And that's the reason we need also ancestral wisdom. How to relate to this planet and to the cosmos. Because, you know, we are not alone. We are travelers in the universe. 
but we are not forever here, just for a while. And we must remember that we are, we are just another species. And actually, not so much intelligent. So, we must remember who we are. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment, or I can uh, just uh, add briefly to that? I really, really acknowledge that. I mean, one of the things that's also is often um, somehow attached to this um, this movement around ecocide is that is is looking to, looking for a kind of a silver bullet, you know, something that's going to fix everything. Ecocide law is not going to fix everything, but we do think that without it, it's going to be difficult to fix anything. So it's one of those kind of necessary but not sufficient ingredients and and totally yeah. totally with when on you know it, it's a start it's not you know there's so much more that needs to be done and also coming back to your far away thing in, in the question that you you said in the beginning um i think this is one of the issues that we have currently with the you know, international justice system is that you know the the the, the ecocides that take place are often taking place in local communities, in developing countries, and in um, the, the so-called global south, whereas the decisions that lead to them are taken in the wealthy north. Um, and so there is a sort of a way that um, criminalizing ecocide, because those international crimes aim at the people at the top of the tree, if you like, the top of that, that decision-making um, sequence, that there's a, it does give some potential for rebalancing that, for actually, you know, directing, you know, that that crime or you know, having it relevant to those decision makers in the wealthy north in a way that has not perhaps hitherto been in, been available. Okay. Anyone? Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, bear with me. This is wading into a little bit of political philosophy. I, when I was preparing for this panel, um, I had seen that there's a sort of thought experiment that um, philosophy students engage in. And it is, you know, how do we know that murder is wrong? How do we know that killing another person is wrong? And when it comes to killing the environment, on a mass scale, harming the environment. Just, I mean, how do we know that that is wrong? I mean, I suspect that you all will say it's wrong. Um, I'd put a wager on that. But how do you know? How do you know? And again, I say, bear with me. I know that's a heady question. I think I've stumped the panel. <laughs> Um, en el Ecuador, por ejemplo, hay el famoso caso que sigue en los pueblos indígenas del nororiente amazónico que se llama el caso Texaco. In Ecuador, for example, we have this famous uh, case that is being followed by uh, the uh, native people in the northeast uh, of uh, Ecuador, which is the, uh, the Texaco case. Es un juicio de los pobladores contra la multinacional uh, Chevron, Texaco. Chevron. This, this is uh, a famous uh, trial that is being uh, followed, uh, which is uh, where the multinational uh, petrol company uh, Chevron. Ahí se puede ver claramente la destrucción masiva. You can clearly see uh, the massive destruction there. La contaminación de los ríos, la destrucción del ecosistema, eh, las enfermedades de las comunidades. River pollution and destruction of uh, nature and the diseases that are rampant among, among the, uh, the people, uh, the inhabitants there, uh, of native people. Creo que eso es un ejemplo visible de lo que es un ecocidio. I think that is a uh, visible evidence of what an ecocide consists upon. Igual puede ser con una minera, minería a gran escala, que arrasa montañas enteras, bosques primarios, para sacar oro, uranio, plata, y destruye todos los ecosistemas. No sabemos cuántas especies puede haber desaparecido ahí. 
You can also compare that with uh, mining, uh, with, where mining companies erase uh, entire um, mountains or uh, forests just uh, so they can uh, mine and extract um, gold or silver for uh, one year. Or, uh, and uh, we see that entire uh, natures and um, parts of nature are completely uh, destroyed. Y los impactos son visibles, no solo en el sitio, sino como en toda su cadena. Los ríos, que las comunidades, el bosque cercano, todo, todo es impactado. Eso para mí es un ecocidio, muy claro. And you can see that uh, the impact is uh, visible, uh, not only for uh, in the close uh, proximity, for example, the, uh, the rivers being contaminated, uh, the communities are being impacted, uh, the nature is uh, destroyed. Uh, therefore, for me, this consists of uh, a visible ecocide. Uh, yeah, political philosophy. I mean, these these critical questions of why we decide things, uh, they usually surface around uh, ideas that are challenging the status quo, challenging the, the powers that be. Uh, how do we know that it's okay to damage nature in the interest of the economy? And that's that, that's just as relevant a question. Uh, but the thing is, uh, we that that are speaking for changes when it comes to the environment, or I mean, we could name other topics like uh, being good to refugees. That's a big question in Europe these days. Uh, we're always accused of having emotional arguments because that's a way to sort of belittle what we stand for. Uh, but emotion is just a very good reason to do stuff. We're emotional beings, we're human beings that, that have emotions and all of our lives are based around those. Uh, why, why is murder wrong? That's also just an emotion, but that's something that we agree on. Uh, so I think the, the threshold of proof when it comes to uh, why should it be wrong to damage the environment, uh, it's sometimes put too high, uh, mm -hmm. but that's by the people that, that benefit from us not succeeding. Yes, how do we know that something is wrong? Because you can feel it. Just as simple as that. You know, when we talk about her harmony with nature, it's harmony with with within us, ourselves, because we are nature. We are the ones who relate to each other. We couldn't exist in our own. And every time that something is gone, part of us die. And that's wrong. So, you know, when uh, when you grow in this deep relationship with other beings, and you don't see them as things, but as beings, then you, you can feel that touch. When you see the stars as wonder, as a wonder, as a mystery, then you realize that there is a mystery in us. And sometimes we, we don't have to know what is mystery. We want to live in mystery. We don't have to know everything. But we know that we do wrong when we kill some other being. Not just a human being. And when we take, we ask permission. And we don't take more than we need. That's the balance that we are looking for. Okay. Um, I, I'd also like to ask, I mean, we have a lot of wisdom and knowledge on this stage, and uh, in, there's got to be frustration that comes with uh, sort of this this thick skin of the political sphere of sort of piercing that to 
uh, engender change, engender, uh, push the world in in a in a more sustainable direction. And uh, you know, for each of you, how do you deal with that frustration? Is it something you channel into your work? Um, you know, for people out there watching, they may be feeling the same thing. Uh, and so, what would you say to them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can start. I mean, I mean, obviously, from the, the, the scientific point of view, we, it's in deep shock um, now that um, that so little action has been taken uh, for so long. I mean, um, as, 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 as Jojo says, you know, when you look at the text from 1972 um, and, and before that, the awareness that of the planetary scale risks we're taking um, to the life support system were, were known. And, and now we have absolutely unequivocal evidence that uh, what we need to do. And not only that, we have evidence that if we act at scale now, um, we will be creating a better world, a better life for, for everyone. Um, you know, we can have a high standard of living. You know, there's 8 billion people on Earth right now. Um, that's that's going to grow to to 9, perhaps even 10 billion. But we can show that we can all have a high standard of living um, with that number of people. Um, and we can substantially reduce the risk of destabilizing the planet. This this is all possible and it's affordable. In fact, the, the cost of it would be uh, less than the cost of dealing with the, the pandemic. Um, so this is a, this is an affordable challenge um, to do. So so it's, it's doubly frustrating then that we're not getting anything like the momentum. And this is down to vested interests. So it's a, it's a frustration at um, uh, the scale of best, the scale and power of those um, in the fossil fuel industry and other industries that are um, uh, resisting change. Because we did a survey last year, three in four people in G20 countries want economic systems change. Um, they want the kind of change we need, uh, which I, I think then, you know, Ecosite then is, it provides an, another mechanism, a new mechanism to kind of force that change uh, through, which I think is essential. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say that I, mean, I com completely understand that and, and that, that sense of frustration is I, I mentioned earlier and I think it's, it's, it's all over. I'm also aware that you know, we've only got a, a, a few minutes left so I'll, I'll try and be brief but um, I think what has been shown as well is that taking action um, and that you know, action can vary and, you know, it could be so many different things. It could be, you know, writing to your elected representative. It could be turning up for a demonstration. It could be telling your friends about ecocide law. It could be, you know, there, there's so many things ranging, you know, and, and they, they can all be sort of touched from what inspires you and what you feel able to do. Um, I think, I mean, sometimes I've, somebody has asked me, how do I be an activist? And in a way, it's like we, we're now at a stage where we're all, activists in our different in our different areas and or starting from the thing that that outrages you because that's the thing you care about you know that's that speaks to the emotion speaks to the feeling that something is wrong you know so it's so it's like that that's your area if you like um and the how i think speaks to what you love to do you know it's how do you apply what you love to do to the thing that makes you outraged that for me is the answer yeah yeah i think uh, like Giorgio said, taking this frustration and turning it into outrage that becomes fuel for whatever you're doing, that, that uh, works fine for me. Uh, and then just keeping in mind, I mean, if, if you're uh, supporting something you believe in, um, I mean, wh what I somehow, sometimes uh, imagine is like if my grandchildren 40 years from now start looking through the annals of parliament and, and see something I did and say, hey, it was okay. Then, I, then I'm good. Uh, Patricia Mendahi, do you have anything you want to add? Okay, okay. So uh, we, we're come up against time here. Uh, although I, so I, I could ask this panel questions for a couple hours, maybe next year. Um, to to close us out today. Uh, Andres is going to say a few words, and I haven't given him a proper introduction, so just very quickly. Um, he is a member of parliament for the Pirate Party in Iceland. Um, during his five years in office, he's consistently been a champion of green politics. 
And most recently, he put forward a parliamentary resolution urging the Icelandic government to propose adding ecocide to the ICC's mandate. And that resolution uh, has gained broad political support. Thank you. Uh, I'm a bit stuck with something uh, Giorgio said at the beginning. Uh, what would the world look like if? And we can just imagine what would the world look like if we'd taken uh, the outcome document of the Stockholm Conference 50 years ago seriously. Because uh, we need to sprint to succeed today. Uh, but the global international uh, political community has been doing incremental, very slow changes over the past 50 years. But some of us have been sprinting. Uh, corporations have been sprinting. Uh, overconsumption was invented in these 50 years, not because it's in human nature to overconsume, but it, because it benefits people that make money out of overconsumption. Uh, extractive industries have been uh, taking leaps and bounds in the past 50 years. The fossil fuel industry especially. I mean, the amount of fossil fuels that was extracted in 1972 it, it, it dwarfs in comparison what we're doing now. Uh, and we're always doing more and more of that. Uh, so we absolutely need a bigger tool to, to address these things. We need something that uh, holds us all accountable because what's happening, what we're seeing in all countries is that these uh, huge multinational corporations that are the perpetrators of probably most examples of ecocide. They are uh, working in collaboration with governments to uh, weaken the, the protection nature has in countries to get their projects through. Uh, we have examples of this in every country, and this is something that uh, we found resonated well with the Icelandic public when we put the resolution forward, because uh, we have international corporations operating in Iceland that yeah. have gotten a rebate on, on environmental law. So every country has these problems uh, on, a, on a varying scale. Yeah. Uh, so for a global problem, we need global solutions and we need something that's bigger than, than national parliaments to address it. Uh, we as national legislators are just basically too weak. In, in in our own uh, countries to to do anything that's why we need to join forces and and do do something that uh, stretches over national boundaries uh, and yeah sort of complementing what Giorgio has been doing with with ecocide uh, we have uh, the ecocide alliance uh, a group of parliamentarians that's working uh, each in their own country to uh, put ecocide on the agenda in our uh, national national legislature or in any other way we we see fit uh, it was started what a year and a half ago by Marie Toussaint uh, a member of the European Parliament and now we are around 30 and probably 20-ish countries uh, and this is incredibly important for us that are active at this stage. Uh, we are borrowing ideas, we're getting support, we're uh, giving back up to each other uh, because uh, we are, even if we're part of the political elite, we're also doing activism in that role. Uh, and as every activist understands, it's uh, sometimes a lonely role to have. Uh, but we're making success. So the resolution that uh, we put forward in Iceland is based on the successful resolution of the Belgian uh, parliament. So whenever we uh, advance in, in one country, we, we can use that as a stepping stone to advance in another. And, uh, and yeah, what we also realized when we put this forward in Iceland was that uh, people were ready. Uh, the the grassroots civil society, the NGOs, had been talking and thinking about ecocide for years. I mean, we're sitting in the hall where 50 years ago, 
for two days, NGOs were discussing ecocide in connection to the Stockholm conference at that, that, that time. Uh, so we have broad support from NGOs in Iceland, specifically from, from the youth uh, environmental organization. And we uh, found that the public just gets it, understands what we're saying. We maybe have to explain the scale we're talking about because people know these local environmental damages that have gone unpunished or, or sort of uh, with impunity. Uh, we need to tell them, yes, that's the basic idea, but we're talking about bigger stuff like global issues. But that's easier than, than starting from scratch and, and having to explain to people why it's bad to harm nature, because that's something people know just from your hearts. Thank you. Thank you. And so th unfortunately, that's it. This is such a wonderful panel. I, thank you all. And um, yeah, I, that, that's that's it. <laughs> Give them a hand. <laughs>